Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the third session uh, of our conference today, uh, looking beyond the Brussels buff bubble uh, in the green transition. And <clears throat> this session will focus uh, on the green industry transition, uh, which of course is something that uh, was brought up in the first session. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a very important uh, international uh, trade dynamic uh, relating to CBAM, uh, to leveling the playing field for European industry and uh, limiting carbon leakage. Um, but it is also highlighting uh, some of the more sensitive uh, internal divisions in Europe, uh, notably kind of this uh, west-east uh, climate gap, uh, which is <clears throat> quite, quite sensitive uh, for industry to the east. And uh, some of these um, you know, older uh, manufacturing infrastructure facilities. And so I think a way to, to frame this is both not only uh, internationally for European competitiveness, but also uh, internally to see uh, whether or not uh, industrial policy can narrow rather, rather than widen uh, this kind of west-east gap. So I just wanted to uh, sort of generally uh, put, put some framing uh, here before I introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, we have, of course, Dr. Georg Zachman, uh, who needs no introduction at this point. Um, and he will be uh, presenting uh, an upcoming Bruegel study on the, <clears throat> the competitiveness and competition policy for Europe's green transition. Uh, we also have two distinguished speakers uh, from Germany and, and Italy. We have uh, Julia Nvari, who is a research associate from uh, the energy and climate change think tank ECHO. And she is focusing on industrial decarbonization, uh, especially for the innovative technologies in steel, plastic, and cement. So we really look forward to, uh, to hearing about the, uh, the strides that are being made in, in Italy. And of course, we have uh, Mr. Philip Steinberg, who is the DG for Economic Policy of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, as well as the uh, Ministry Coordinator for Sustainable Development of the German government. Um, this includes several, uh, several items in his portfolio from competition policy to uh, regional structural policy, uh, Eastern Germany, and also uh, procurement policy and uh, macroeconomic forecasting. Uh, he is also part of the supervisory board of the German Agency for Unemployment and Nuclear Waste Fund, as well as a vice chairman of the Economic Policy Committee for the OECD. So I think we have a fantastic roster of speakers here to, uh, to dive further into the nuances of Europe's industrial transformation uh, with the international competitive dynamic, but as well as the internal uh, regional dynamic. So with that, I'll hand the floor to, uh, to Georg, if you could get us started. Sure. Um, yeah, many thanks, Nolan. And uh, I'm, I'm really extremely pleased to have the opportunity to, to present some sorts from this upcoming paper. And I really would be, uh, I'm hopeful to discuss some of those with, with Philip and, and Julia and, and you, Nolan. Um, let me let me really try to to have a relatively abstract uh, start and provide you with a bit of an abstract framework because the transition is such a big animal that we uh, that we have to uh, that we have to work with and the economy is such a big thing that we should really try to to get a better understanding what we want to achieve with industrial and competition policy. So I would like to pursue essentially in three, uh, three steps. First, I would like to provide a bit of a high-level analysis uh, in which I try to show you that the transition implies that in important sectors, the role of competition needs to be resolved because these sectors will uh, change 
dramatically. The second element is that um, there are important policy levers uh, to, uh, to improve resource allocations through, uh, uh, also through competition, and um, they, are, uh, they are complex and, uh, and sector-specific, and I want to, to give you a relatively uh, a brief view on that. And then I'll come to, to some still relatively generic conclusions. Um, uh, but my main purpose today is essentially to tell you that beyond targets and policies, which we are discussing in climate policy, we should now take also a fresh look into the institutions, in particular into competition, that should ensure an efficient resource allocation. So starting with the, with the first point, if you look into models of, the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of decarbonization, those climate models typically see relatively acceptable cost of decarbonization, but they often miss two points. They miss the distributional effects, and they miss the potentially huge cost of resource misallocations. Uh, and what we, what we know is that the allocation of resources in an economy is guided by kind of complex institutions, so from the central banks, the regulators, uh, the um, um, uh, laws, um, customs, and I mean, it's, it's a very, very complex um, network of, uh, of individual institutions that guide resource allocation, and this network is very different between countries. I mean, in some countries, the state is taking a stronger role. In other countries, uh, uh, it is more competition between companies. And there is a wide space between essentially pure state planning and, uh, and pure free markets. And kind of it's not a, not a line, but it's a space. And I want to make the point that, uh, um, uh, that these often sector-specific institutions that we have, especially the role of competition, need to be resought for, for three reasons in the, in the transition. The first one is that transition itself will result in structures for which the current institutions were not built. So just look at the electricity sector. Electricity will be the main fuel uh, in, uh, um, in, in the decarbonization. That is, uh, that is almost clear by now. Um, that, uh, Electricity will be then consumed, produced by everybody, it will be stored. So we will have a completely new setup of the electricity system and we need also new rules to ensure that resource allocation in these sectors is, uh, is happening in the right way. There are market design uh, attempts there, but uh, they are not European and they are still, I mean, falling, falling short probably. The second, uh, the second challenge that I see is that uh, some of the challenges of the transition can be better uh, uh, addressed by ensuring robust competition. And what I'm talking of here is, for example, innovation. We will need massive innovation for, uh, for getting, uh, getting our targets at low cost, um, but this innovation will, to a very high degree, come from uh, companies in competition because they have the best incentives to put the money into the right things. So we need well-functioning competition here. And the third point is that um, um, well, competition is good and, and fine, but if we only focus on competition in current markets, we might miss the need for speedy coordination of stakeholders in an uncertain and fast-moving transition. So, for example, these well-known chicken and egg problems with electric charging stations and electric uh, uh, vehicle production and, uh, and, and buyers. And I mean, you, you have kind of a network of things that has to work together and you need to ensure some coordination and maybe pure competition alone will not be able to, to roll that out. But from what I explained, you already see that, that this picture is not a, uh, is not a simple and, and straightforward one where, where I can say more competition or less competition is, uh, is good for the transition. Now, there are important policy levers uh, to, to improve resource allocation, and I will always pick on resource allocation because I think that's, that's in the end the thing that I can represent in a model to, to see a bit whether some institutional setup is a good setup or a bad setup, whether it gives me a resource allocation that is as efficient as possible. And the, the first lever is adjusting competition rules. And yes, I think we should protect competition uh, uh, for innovation purposes, as I, as I said before. And I think competition policy should take even more into account that innovation is one of the, uh, one of the prime, uh, uh, prime kind of future welfare enhancing uh, uh, ways that, uh, that they can, uh, uh, yeah, that, that competition is, is fruitful for. 
The second element is that we, uh, that we can consider sustainability in competition decisions already today. I mean, there are rules like considering uh, green quality as a quality of products and thereby then judging whether this green quality is reduced in, uh, um, by a merger, for example, or looking into efficiency defense um, in, uh, in, in merger cases where I say, okay, but if two companies merge and there are so much green efficiencies from that, maybe we should allow it. So taking these, uh, these green elements that we already have into account and maybe putting a stronger weight on them could be helpful. Um, another element that I find very important is providing a more legal certainty. Um, we have to act extremely fast in the transition. We have some 30 years to decarbonize fully and uh, companies cannot wait until, uh, until we have a new fully functioning legal system uh, that, uh, that is set up. So we need to find ways to, to provide some, some legal certainty to, uh, to those that want to invest now. And uh, as it all is so complex, we need to improve the competition authorities' capacity. So they need, uh, yeah, need more stuff essentially to, uh, to, to check all those things in a proper way. Then, so that was adjusting competition rules. The second one is designing markets. Designing markets is kind of the, uh, yeah, one of the uh, yeah, king's disciplines of, uh, 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 of microeconomists, and it's, uh, it's super complicated, as you, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, also here, maybe a few rather generic uh, uh, ideas. Uh, maybe one can have a different approach to new versus old sectors, so temporary exemptions for new sectors uh, such as in hydrogen industry while keeping uh, old sectors under the old systems. Uh, we have to make sure that access to new platforms and systems, and I'm talking here, for example, of circular economy, which I think is one of the, uh, one of the potentially big future systems where I can already today imagine that Amazon with their logistic chain is going to take that over because they're the only ones that are mm, potentially able to, to do the logistics. So we need to make sure that, uh, that access to these networks and platforms is, uh, is ensured, uh, but at the same time, it should not prevent us from investing here. And then um, uh, a point that also, uh, uh, probably uh, Philip will make uh, policy experimentation. Uh, so we need room for policy experimentation because policies are, we don't know what the right policies are and we need to, to try, out, uh, try out new things in a, um, in a limited space to see what works and what does not work. Now, the last point is the most uh, controversial point, I would say, that is more direct state control. And uh, uh, the question is whether there are some sectors where, where this is uh, warranted or not. Um, I mean, there's light touch things such as allowing alliances, it's something that the EU is, for example, doing for batteries alliance, and, uh, and um, I think Germany and Italy are doing similar things, so helping coordinate uh, private actors. We have regulated sectors with regulatory agencies. Here we should kind of make sure that those regulatory agencies not just look into the pockets of today's consumers, but also a bit into the investments and into the future. Um, and then we have the question of state control, which is nicely linked to the next panel, which is fiscal rules, because if you want state control, you need public budgets, and if you, need, uh, if you want public budgets, then you, uh, then you have to look into the question of, uh, of, uh, of fiscal rules. Now, I know that different member states have very different views on those topics um, and um, um, also in different sectors it might make yeah, uh, different tools uh, are, um, uh, are, to be, are to be considered. Let me close with, uh, with four generic conclusions um, uh, or recommendations. So the first one is um, there is um, potentially trade-offs between protecting existing jobs and companies versus uh, kind of helping new value chains and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and companies and jobs. And uh, I think competition policy needs to find an answer to that or kind of the design of, of competition in a, uh, in, a, in a transition. The second one is I, I think a no-brainer is we, we should do everything to encourage innovation and uh, we, we should look into the uh, economic science uh, literature on what helps here and what does not help. And um, the uh, third element is uh, we need ways to, uh, to help to coordinate investments uh, uh, because we have to quickly scale up different things that are linked in, in value chains and they need to happen at the same time but without killing uh, competition afterwards. And we need to allow for failure because we, we cannot wait for everything to work out, but we have to potentially do more things than we need and then see what works and what does not work. Now, to, uh, to conclude, um, 
Uh, beyond targets and policies, we should also take a fresh look into the institutions, in particular in those that uh, are rules that guide competition to, uh, to ensure that we have efficient resource allocation. And competition always sounds a bit like uh, a trade-off with distributional effects, but I think those two things are working in the same direction, because if we are uh, very wasteful with resources in a transition, then the effects on, on population will be, uh, will be much more costly than, uh, than without well-functioning resource allocation. Thank you. Thank you, Georg. Your, um, really nice way to, uh, to open the session here, uh, thinking about uh, different uh, channels for investment, cer certainly innovation. And I can't help but, uh, you know, bring this into, back into kind of the member states or regional level here uh, in the EU, where, where of course, uh, you know, uh, innovation, research and development spending in, in Eastern parts are much lower. Uh, and just generally, as, as was referred to earlier, uh, governments are tend to be less, less supportive less strategic uh, of these long-term goals, which is of course uh, something that you need uh, to provide this uh, certainty to uh, investment certainty to companies, of course. <clears throat> so really interesting. I want to also just quickly remind our audience to please uh, drop the active questions into our Slido Q&A. And I'm, I'm monitoring that, so uh, we, Definitely want uh, some of your feedback, some of your questions. Uh, and with that, uh, we can go to, uh, to Julia Navadi, if you'd like to jump in, kind of bringing us the sort of Italian perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nolan. Thank you, Jörg. I find really interesting what you said. And um, I think uh, it is important uh, in this uh, context uh, also to develop a strategy for the industrial decarbonization and it should be done as soon as possible. It is a question of defining the national and also the European industrial sector for the next 30 years. This is, in my opinion, indispensable to guide the manufacturing sector, supply chains, and the public and private investment towards innovative and zero emission projects. At the same time, the strategy should allow countries to increase resilience against price volatility, reduce the dependence on fossil imports, and remain competitive. Evidence-based scenarios require a full decarbonization of our economy, where energy efficiency is complemented by an exit strategy from fossil fuels. The condition for maintaining an international leadership and limiting exposure to the volatility of fossil fuel prices passes through a strategy for the innovation of the production processes. The challenge of decarbonization cannot be addressed by a progressive deindustrialization of countries, but reinterpreted by a strategy of innovation and relaunch. In this context, the public sector is a key player, not only as an extensor of policies and measures, but also as a financer and a lever for decarbonization with uh, its own choices of uh, public spending, facilitations and uh, support to businesses and research. So the role of the state is uh, fundamental to reduce the risk linked to the adoption of um, innovative technological solutions uh, through specific policies. In Italy, there isn't a specific strategy for the decarbonization of industry. In the Integrated National Energy and Climate Plan, there are some measures that can contribute to, re to the reduction of emissions, such as the rising carbon price, the phase out of coal for energy production by 2025, the use of hydrogen in um, energy intensive sectors, However, to activate a significant volume of investment and to maintain the competitiveness of industries, it's not enough to have a series of projects or action, but it is necessary to develop a current overview. 
In the absence of um, a clear policy choice uh, and um, an action plan on industry, the resources available will be spent uh, inefficiently. Public uh, resources are also an important stimulus for the innovation of uh, small and medium enterprises, as they can represent a lever also for private resources. In Italy, the industry sector is uh, characterized by a significant presence of uh, small and medium companies, but this is a feature also of the entire European Union. In the, so in the process of decarbonization, it is necessary to consider both the dynamics of large industries, but it is also crucial to consider as mass their role. It's important to develop a policy proposal that allows mass to maintain their competitiveness at the international level because they have a significant role in the diversification of production and uh, in the capacity for innovation. So it is necessary to adopt a short, medium and long-term approach, avoiding generating carbon lock-in. Um, uh, to do it, it is necessary that uh, all sectors significant for the economic for the economy are considered in the transition, so also in the national recovery plans. Uh, that is, and that an important share of uh, resources are allocated uh, to those sectors, in particular to the R2 abate sectors, where few innovative solutions have reached uh, um, high levels of technological and commercial maturity. It's a, a priority to accelerate the technological response uh, to the decarbonization because uh, only with the coverage, at least partial, of the risk uh, with uh, public resources, uh, it will be possible to attract uh, private investments. Uh, without a clear strategy, it will be difficult for private capital to contribute to the growth. So in conclusion, uh, an effective uh, decarbonization of industry requires the development of strategies for the decarbonization of various industrial sector. The strategy will serve to drive innovation towards low carbon technologies and processes, uh, gradually eliminate the use of uh, fossil fuels and allow countries to remain competitive internationally. The identification of strategies that can contribute uh, to transforming both production systems, but also uh, the final demand. Then the analysis um, of the characteristics and role of SMES uh, in the decarbonization process, the activation of a new welfare and labor policies so that the transition is uh, inclusive and a source of new employment. And finally, an active role of the public sector in clarity of policies, in the definition of uh, objectives, and um, in supporting uh, of investments. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Beautiful presentation. And of course, kind of gets me thinking about, about ETS as well, um, as part of uh, you know, the uh, uh, disincentive, of course, to, uh, to, to emit. But at the same time, uh, you know, we need funded measures for the innovation, for the R&D, uh, for energy efficiency. And as you said, uh, you know, predominantly, this is kind of an S SME landscape, uh, maybe a little different uh, in Germany. Um, so with that, uh, we can go across to uh, Mr. Steinberg, uh, if you'd like to uh, give us your perspective, not only from Germany, but uh, you know, all of the other uh, hats that you're wearing. And we appreciate it. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Nolan, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so um, we are talking about uh, green industrial policy here. I mean, I think it's uh, you know, on this panel, and it has become clear from uh, Julia's and uh, um, uh, Georg's uh, contributions that obviously that it's quite a complex endeavor um, and a multi-dimensional exercise. And uh, I would like to try to to sketch out how I see or. What I believe, how we see in Germany, like this this topic, green industrial policy, or uh, as, as Julia puts, how Julia puts it, like a strategy for the decarbonization of, of, of the industry. And I think um, it's maybe helpful and uh, to to distinguish like 
two, two, two uh, dimensions of this exercise. Uh, one, let's say, more vertical intervention or vertical policies, and then and more horizontal policies. And, and, uh, and Georg has talked quite a bit about competition and, and the regulatory framework, which is necessary for, for that. So I think what is, uh, what is quite important and, and what we are doing in Germany, but I, but I would argue what we are doing in, in Europe, um, like as, as vertical interventions, or let's say as, as framing for, for a new green industrial policy, that's of course a more active role of the state. And I, I remind all of you when Peter Altmaier, my minister, my outgoing minister, presented this uh, industrial strategy um, in uh, two years back, two years ago, like he was heavily criticized, uh, uh, being nationalist, uh, being, being mm. reactionary. And I mean, you can talk about some language he used, but in, in, in base, basically, he came up with, uh, with many of the policies that uh, we are actually now putting into place. But what are these uh, policies? So what are uh, what are necessary in, in ingredients of a more vertical industrial industry policy approach? Well, I think one concept, which is uh, hugely successful now, is the con concept of important approaches of common European interests. So basically, that's the IPSAI uh, approach. What does it mean? Well, a couple of countries go, go together in an innovative field with a high R&D content. Um, and then the state actually plays an active uh, role in subsidizing this, uh, this, uh, this insight. So I think this we, we, are, we, are, we are rolling out in microelectronics, in cloud computing, uh, in health, and many other, other areas. So I think this is an example where, because you know, of a very traditional justification and even a neoclassical justification of state intervention, you know, there, there are coordination problems, high uncertainty. Um, of, the, of, of the success of those pro, pro, um, programs, high co cost of those programs without, without actually the, 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 the knowledge that it will be successful, therefore intervention of the state is justified. And so the IPSA um, approach, I think, is, is, is one approach which is certainly a key factor of green industrial policy. Um, so second, a second um, um, uh, instrument, I think, obviously, which everybody talks about, and it's, it's not so easy to, to put into practice that this fam famous concept of carbon contracts for difference. Uh, what does it mean, of course? Well, um, if you introduce a, a CO2 price and a CO2 price, and um, I think we believe in Germany, but I would argue in Europe, we believe that is, of course, a key horizontal instrument for, uh, for green industrial policy. Uh, but if you have this, this price, we need, of co course, accompanying um, instruments, and, and there I totally agree with that. Great. Um, um, yeah, we have to focus on institutions, on mechanisms, on instruments, and I think carbon content for difference can be such an instrument um, in order, of course, to, uh, to help European industry to remain competitive in case the CO2 uh, price is, uh, or the, uh, the um, uh, like uh, production um, is, is still not competitive having a having a high CO2 price um, um, that is, is I think the, the key concept and then the question is how to implement it on the national level on the European level uh, how to, to execute it will you have to use uh, tender procedures uh, um, to do so on the European level that could be could be indeed an option on the national level um, it's it's more uh, more complicated so I still carbon context for difference I think it's key it's in the co coalition committee in Germany as well in order to help industry to remain competitive, whilst at the same time actually increasing CO2 pricing in the ETS sector, but also in the non non ETS sector. Um, and therefore, I think those are two two, uh, two two main instruments. Of course, Julia mentioned many other programs. Of course, uh, we need to to roll out, and in Germany we have uh, loads of them as well. But I think actually the IPSA approach. And the carbon context for difference uh, approach. I think they are two main pillars of like modern green industrial uh, policy. But then, of course, we cannot only talk about direct state intervention, and that's basically more or less um, CCFD and uh, and ITSAIs are direct state intervention. We need that, but of course, we need, and that's very important for me as well and for us. We need, of course, like horizontal, the, the right horizontal framework conditions for green and industrial. Um, uh, policy. So I've already mentioned the main instrument here, of course, is the CO2 price. 
in all sectors. And, and of course, there are lots of the um, propositions here. Fit for 55 uh, um, proposal now wants to introduce ETS2. We have already a price uh, for CO2 in Germany also uh, for, uh, for the, the non-ETS sector. So that has to be harmonized, but that's certainly important. Then we need, of course, some, something uh, in order to, to, to introduce this uh, CO2 price. We need something we call a climate club, a climate alliance. We want to get many countries together in order to do so because of competitive disadvantages. And then it would be so difficult to introduce the, the third element, which is key for this horizontal approach. We need some, um, some CBAM, some carbon border adjustment mechanism in order to, uh, to make this, 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 this work. So first element of this horizontal approach, CO2 price comes now comes not as, as a surprise to you, I, I guess. And then uh, here, taking it up on what Eero said, of course, uh, we need like the right competition law framework because uh, yes, competition is about the allocation of resources, the efficient allocation of resources. And that's of course key also. So in, um, if we talk about the decarbonization of the, the industry and here, of course, we, we are actually still quite at the beginning of a discussion, how to do that, how to do that in antitrust, how, how to do this in merger control, because of course there's always a tension built in because competition authorities are competent, competent for competition. They are not so competent to assess what actually industri green industrial policy instruments are actually really like the, the ones to, to choose. So it's quite difficult actually to say, you know, if you say, if, if you have like a cartel uh, of, of two companies, they say, oh, it's because we want to protect the environment and we use CO2 with our new technology. And um, is that enough, you know? So it's not so easy. So we are thinking, of course, about guidelines, about exemptions, but it's, it's not so easy because competition authorities, of course, have to have the, the, the competence to, to do that. And in, in, in general, of course, it's, it's for the legislator the European or the national leg legislator to decide about those instruments and not the competition authority. So um, yes, we need to green our competition law framework, very important, but still we need to make it in a, do it in a way that actually it can be handled by competition authorities. I would argue the main thrust, the main task here still is for the legislator actually to actually establish vertical and horizontal policies and, and uh, decide which instruments to use and not to put everything on, 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 on competition. Um, what else? If we are talking about horizontal rules, of course, state aid rules are key. Everybody knows that. The IPCIs, of course, are an instrument which actually, if you, if you are mean, you could say which circumvent state aid rules, I would argue, which are actually adapt state of rules to, to today's necessities. And you all, you all know that we are talking about about the re uh, revised climate energy and environmental aid guidelines actually taking into account um, the new necessities of decarbonization of the, uh, the, 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 the industry. And last but not least, uh, I think Julia has mentioned the role of the state, of course, as, as, some, as, 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 as a buyer and as, as, as somebody setting standards. Of course, it's about public procurements, um, which actually is, is, is key as well to like decarbonizing of, of uh, industry and decarbonize, decarbonizing actually our uh, the, the way actually goods and services are being uh, provided and, and produced. So I think it's, it's key and we have done that in Germany with new guidelines for public procurements for the federal level, actually taking into account here as well, CO2 emissions by, um, in public procurement procedures. So we have, we actually, we have set up, we are setting up a system to calculate what we call shadow CO2 prices, which, which will be established and then on the federal level, first we roll it out on the federal level and, so, and, and then success, successively we will actually roll it out on other levels as well. We have to take this into account as well. So basically to sum up, green industrial policy or decarbonization of the industry. Of course, it's a multi-dimensional process, and that has become clear. And so it's a bit. Sometimes you get a little bit lost because everybody is talking about his or her favorite subjects in a way. So what I what I try to do is actually to to, or, to organize it a little bit. We need vertical interventionist uh, policies. Yes, there is a new role for the state. We use in Germany and and, and in Europe. I think I would argue use uh, in, 
especially dip size, important projects of common European interest, and of course carbon contracts to difference, main instruments, and then other support um, uh, policies, of course, of the state. And then we need horizontal policies that, of course, CO2 price uh, signal uh, in a climate coalition with a CBAM mechanism, um, which is very difficult to implement. We will see that in, 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 in very uh, a very short uh, term, uh, but then also, also of course, competition law framework, which uh, which uh, um, uh, assures eff effective resource allocation and uh, takes into consideration this new sustainability necessities. And then, of course, public procurement law is, is something as well. Public procurement framework and um, actually is something which can, can can actually set standards and we can actually um, help actually the private sector. By, by being the vanguard, the avant-garde in a way, actually to do to do the same. That this is my attempt, <coughs> attempt in a nutshell, you know, to summarize the, the green industrial policy. Of course, we could talk about many other other uh, sectors, but I really try to kind of conceptualize it. And I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that, Philip. Uh, it, indeed, multidimensional, extremely complex. You know, there's several moving parts, but I think you've really uh, helped us to kind of uh, set the uh, the framework for for the Q and A session, um, and actually, I think perhaps uh, one of the questions was was partially answered here, uh, which is how can policies incite the private sector to invest in green innovation? So I think definitely IPSEIs uh, are uh, you know public funding vehicles that that certainly. Um, leverage private sector investment uh, in R&D innovation. And so I think that's absolutely critical, as you said, is, is one of this, these um, kind of vertical uh, state-led uh, policy interventions. Um, we also have a great question coming back to uh, the issue of technology neutrality. Uh, and at what point uh, we might be picking the winners, leaving the losers, of course, you know, you can look at uh, electric vehicles and batteries, and now maybe even hydrogen at the EU level. Um, and of course, the EPSAEs are, are some of the, the, the funding vehicles uh, for these wider policies. But maybe even coming back to, to Georg, you can maybe elaborate on kind of this issue of, of technology neutrality uh, as, it, as it pertains to you know, the efficiency of, of resource allocation. So that's that's one area. There was also a question about the impact of IP of, of intellectual property. So, so we have um, you know technology neutrality, IP, which is maybe more um, international. Uh, and I'll put one more question out there, and then we can maybe kind of uh, go through the speakers. The other uh, coming back to uh, to Philip, which we can chamber, is how would you elaborate on the climate club? working together uh, with CBAM and specifically fr coming from Germany uh, and introducing this carbon price floor in Germany. So maybe we can start with Georg, maybe coming back to IP technology neutrality. Um, yes, so first of all, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, especially Philip, that was very interesting and uh, kind of a very comprehensive view on I have one point maybe on that can be framed as a uh, as neutrality question, uh, which I think is something that comes up stronger and stronger in the, uh, in the debates, which is the question on kind of, um, kind of protecting the old industry, the old jobs versus kind of providing the, the framework for, for, the, uh, for a transition that kind of goes deeper than, than just kind of taking something that is there and, and making it green. And my, um, the challenge that I'm, uh, that I'm seeing is that we are currently using these vertical instruments quite targeted to support the existing sectors uh, and uh, to support them essentially the same companies producing the same goods with different methods and uh, bringing them uh, instead of old forms of energy, new forms of energy, but they will again be implicitly subsidized by, uh, by, the, uh, by the taxpayer as they are partly today uh, already. And um, this, in a, in a wider European picture, 
puts up some, some question about uh, fair competition, but it also, in the, in the German discussion, might come up with some questions on, are we really investing in our future comparative advantage? So are, is Germany a country that will live off uh, cheap energy imports, um, but it, it does not produce energy, or should it not rather also try to, uh, to kind of embrace new opportunities that are not in the field of energy intensity uh, that much? So do we really want to, 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 uh, to, uh, to let this uh, opportunity to waste, to, to make an end to, an, uh, to, to a structure that became essentially outdated uh, decades ago because energy in, uh, in Germany became expensive as soon as coal was not the cheapest energy form anymore. Um, so maybe to, to be a bit uh, provocative, uh, um, uh, I would like to yeah, throw this question back. Thank you, Georg, and maybe, <clears throat> well, yeah, I think obviously, uh, you know, the uh, energy input prices are uh, you know, extremely important to competitiveness of, of these companies. So, you know, that can be, that can be regional, that can be EU level. And of course that can, that can be global, um, looking at, you know, how the carbon price is reflected in the energy price, or, uh, for example, in central Eastern Europe, uh, predominantly, uh, nuclear base load energy. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the magic bullet for electricity decarbonization, uh, although, you know, of course, uh, at this point, the, the cost overruns, the, the length, uh, uh, the project length, um, you know, make these, uh, I think, at, the, at, at best questionable to, uh, to meet, let's say, even, you know, 20, 30 uh, climate targets. Um, so maybe, Philip, we could come back to this question about the Climate Club uh, interacting with CBAM and also uh, the Germany introducing a carbon price floor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to talk about that as well. I just would like to, to respond to, to, to Georg. And I mean, he's saying, basically saying, well, I'm using those vertical instruments in order to subsidize the old industry, if I understood you correctly. I'm, I mean, there actually, obviously, it touches on the, the eternal question if you talk about industrial policy and state intervention. So how does the state know what's good, you know, and, and, and all those questions. And they're, of course, and, and, and uh, totally relevant. Um, uh, I agree. Um, still, I would argue. I mean, uh, obviously, we have we have criteria for those IPCI. So uh, an IPCI needs to to provide a contribution to the strategic goals of the EU. They have to be carried through by by several member states. So that guarantees that, you know a certain impartiality. And um, there needs to be co-financing, post positive spillover um, effect, and a high high emphasis on R and D, as as I said, you know. And if you look uh, look what uh, in what, what areas do we have uh, IPCI? So we're talking about microelectronics, about batteries, of course, about hydrogen and pharmaceutical um, uh, industry. So I mean, and there are only you know only certain elements. So I, I would argue that's not the old industry. You know, that's really future oriented uh, oriented uh, areas and. Uh, and therefore, I would say, that, yeah, that, that's uh, that's actually um, the support for uh, for the transformation, and we are all talking about, and, and I think that's really really key. Of course, we have, if you look at the Matsukato debates and so on. Of course, it's always difficult. We want to we want to be technologically neutral. Yes, we do. On the other hand, at the end, at some sometimes, I mean, now here it's basically the industry approaching us. Do we want to have us? And at the end of the day, obviously, sometimes you need to actually get down. And, and, and if somebody asks you, you want to do something with hydrogen, um, then obviously hydrogen might be might be relevant, even if there are other other um, other possibilities to do something. So I would I would argue yes, there is this this problem. And if you look at, at, at all the theories of of, of Philippe Aguillon, of Danny Roderick, uh, and and others, and trying to justify industrial policy, of course, you have always those. There there are always. Uh, Difficulties, of course, uh, when the state has to to, to intervene. Um, Roger talking of, about collaborative uh, and, and approaches, and, and Aguillon argue, arguing more, you know, on a on a let's say more traditional uh, base, basis. But I think that is, uh, uh, I think the IPCI is as good as it gets, um, if I if I may say. So this on the IPCI on on the question of climate club and and, and minimum price and, and carbon borders. And so 
what do we what do we want in Germany? And I just said, talk, had a discussion with uh, officials from the French uh, French ministries uh, on that. I mean, we we do obviously uh, CO two price is not not you know, something which has been universally agreed in the United States. They are still actually in the process of trying to find out how they want to how want to reach their 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 goals. And I believe you know in a market economy, of course, price is a very good. Uh, Signal not the only one. We of course need a mix of regulation and and, and price uh, signals and subsidies, but it's it's an important uh, important element. But then of course it's it, it even if we internalize external effects with this, obviously there is a it provokes of the result is a competitive disadvantage of German or European industries. And then we need, need to do something about it. And then we are talking about carbon border adjustment. The problem with carbon border adjustment is then it's really, if you look at the and it's with the WTO problem, it's a practical problem, how to do it. And then it really is a nightmare. It really is a nightmare. All the discussions I had, I was really disillusioned again and again. And therefore, if we create something which is like a climate club, and of course the EU is a climate club already, but if we, if we try to, if we, if we manage to get China and, and the United States at least on board, and maybe some others, then obviously this question becomes less relevant, you know, and less 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 problematic, and the WTO and the retaliation retortion problem becomes less 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 relevant. So this is really we, we believe, and there maybe we have some let's say nuanced differences or the, the emphasis is different than the French. We would like to have, to have like CO two price climate club and CBAM, you know, uh, together and uh, and um, not uh, let's say uh, focus on on, on one. And, and what is the, what about the minimum price? Well, we have in, in the area which is not covered by the ETS, we have our own CO2 pricing system in, in Germany. We have introduced it, and, and there we basically we have a minimum uh, 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 price uh, price introduced uh, as, as something. Let's say that's a threshold, and um, we, we, we do not want to uh, want to um, go below this this threshold. And if if this happens, uh, the state needs to act in in. in, in in a certain way, so that's the basic uh, the basic idea about what, why that. Well, that's that's. I mean, obviously, you can call it interventionist, not totally market conform, but uh, because of practical uh, and, uh, reasons. That's basically. Uh, I hope I answered the question. So that's the end. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> and and indeed, I think uh, there's another question that's that's uh, really cracking the conversation here, which I was going to introduce, uh, but some anonymous has, has done that, which is. Uh, how do we include the just transition topic or objectives uh, into industrial policy? And maybe maybe we can start with uh, with Julia here. But obviously, um, you know that's one of the the key issues. Um, you know, we were discussing in, in the previous session more when it comes to you know prices of energy and heat to the everyday consumer. But of course, taking this into the uh, industrial context, of course, we're talking about uh, competitiveness, which really uh, equates to jobs, and uh, you know how how some of these uh, big industrial players can uh, can maintain uh, you know the sort of stability of, of communities or cities in some cases. Of course, we have whole regions in transition, uh, but this also obviously applies to uh, the, the major industrial sectors uh, that have been mentioned, so steel, petrochemicals, cement, um, and obviously the, I, this you know connects directly with with the CBAM and the level playing field. So maybe we could go to Julia and you could reflect on how just transition objectives uh, would be uh, included in industrial policies. Yes, I think that uh, the first uh, fundamental thing, uh, thing is to um, define what is uh, a just transition. So uh, which are the features uh, that we have to consider in, on, in order to um, say this is a just, not a just transition. Um, in the literature, I found that I find that Everything goes um, everything go, uh, goes under the concept of uh, just transition. Um, I think that is important at, at the first 
evaluation of the policy proposals for the transition, the local administration, the citizens, because uh, they have the point of view is the uh, region in, tra in transition are um, living every day because it's not uh, only a problem of uh, uh, CO2 emissions in this uh, coal region, but uh, there are a lot of uh, other problems of uh, also toxic uh, emissions. So um, the first thing, thing is to, to elaborate policy with uh, uh, also asking their point, so listening to their point of view. The second thing, uh, important thing, I think, I think it is um, to consider uh, the impact of uh, employment uh, the transition. We in the transition we will uh, lose some uh, uh, some types of uh, uh, employment, but uh, the transition can be a lever in order a source uh, for new types uh, for new green jobs. So in the policy proposals we have to understand uh, to this uh, kind of, of opportunities and uh, to maximize uh, their effects. Um, then I think there can be uh, plenty of uh, uh, indicators of uh, characteristics uh, that we can consider uh, in a just transition, but uh, well, the two most important uh, are, ah, another important is the impact uh, on the environment uh, of uh, the old um, old plants and the new ones. Um, so this is uh, and this is uh, a great problem, uh, a great topic in Italy because we have uh, a lot uh, um, some um, big plant uh, such as the Taranto steel plant. Uh, which uh, during the years uh, have caused uh, a lot of problems. And uh, now the just transition is the opportunity to solve these problems. Yes, exactly. I, I think uh, that's the right way to frame it. I, I hope that, that people do see this as an opportunity because alternatively, um, you know, I think we can all agree that, um, you know, even the world is going in one direction. So um, if you're not, doing your best uh, to implement uh, low carbon technologies or energy efficiency, you're probably going to be uh, on the losing end at the end of the day as, as, as a laggard. So, you know, this, the just transition fund, for example, um, should be something that is, that is used. But then again, uh, certainly in Central Eastern Europe, part of the problem is that we don't have these well-defined uh, national strategies so it's certainly an issue of governance as well, which is uh, which is a challenge. Um, looking back, looking back to the questions, we have another one on standard setting. So and we've got about eight minutes. Um, so we have a question: Can can you address the need to reform standard setting institutions where the incumbents have a current stronghold on the standards? Uh, would anyone like to? jump in on this uh, standard setting. Maybe. Ah, and we have another question. Uh, so these are the last last two, maybe. Um, something on, on uh, if you were a non-EU country, uh, would CBAM in its current shape focus on primary products to encourage advanced manufacturing, or sorry, this was CAB, C-A-B. So I would welcome CAB in its current shape, focusing on primary products to encourage advanced manufacturing. So I guess that's kind of a comment. Uh, would anyone like to come in on CAB or the, the standard setting institutions and talking about uh, you know, the incumbents and sort of the regulatory poll in that sense? Well, I mean, I can, I can, can, can start, start it off. So on standards, I mean, I think that's absolutely, absolutely key, of course, and that's actually one driver for industrial policy, for green industrial policy as well, because obviously standards are key if we, if we talk about, uh, about uh, in industry 4.0, if you talk about uh, uh, all kinds of pl standards, plug-in uh, standards and so on, 
um, we, we need to actually agree on, agree on those. And there, obviously, we are in a systemic uh, competition situation with China once again and with other countries. So, so I mean, and this is here, if we don't, don't actually um, come together, set our own standards, manage to agree on standards, then we are actually, then standards will be imposed by China on us. And therefore, I think standards is really key. We have a lot of standard setting institutions. When I came in here and I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for certain standards, I mean, obviously, if you start to look at it, you think, oh, that's so absolutely boring and technically and, and, and so on. And it might be, but it's really, it's key and it should be, should be an element of, of policy. And I think it's increasingly, increasingly considered to be, to, to be um, uh, a key element of, uh, of, of uh, decarbonization or, or industrial, uh, strategic industrial uh, policy, because if we don't manage to, to congregate together as Europeans, to set our own standards, then actually standards will be imposed on us. So that is, I think, key. Uh, yeah, that's maybe my five cents on, 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 on this. I think on, on CBM, just my, once again, my, my uh, eternal um, uh, point, there is not, there's a proposition of the, of the EU com uh, Commission but I don't think that's the end of the of, of the history um, of the CBM uh, mechanism because uh, we have to actually um, make sure that at least it's practically it's workable and it's it's uh, it's, it's the WTO conform. So I think it's a good start, but it certainly will not be the end result uh, like what we will receive. Thank you, Philip. Uh, yeah. So that, this uh, the other question was was in regard to to CBM. Um, so. The focus on uh, primary products uh, that, that could encourage advanced manufacturing. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I, 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 if, I, if I may, I would duck that question and uh, come back to the to the regional uh, point that, uh, that Julia yeah. made because I found it quite important. Um, I am. I mean, I understand that. Um, that the transition will be a very regional thing and that we have specific sectors that are very focused in specific regions and that uh, we need to, uh, to pay very much attention that we are kind of getting this right because kind of coming from Germany and from, from East Germany, I see that uh, the political repercussions of not getting the transition right are kind of long term and, and, and politically very costly. Um, but having said that, I mean, the, the, the challenge is we, we talked before about the uh, role of incumbents trying to potentially kind of maintain the same sectors, even so they might not be kind of the right thing for the region anymore. Um, so something that, uh, that we did was essentially trying to identify for European regions and on a relatively narrow level, what are potentials in green technologies in the, in the different regions. And the idea how we did that was essentially looking into what are these regions currently doing and what are other regions that are doing that stuff also doing. And that helps one to understand kind of sort of networks and you can kind of really paint out these networks and you get an idea that yeah, regions that produce uh, condensers are often also very good in producing solar panels, for example. And if you, uh, if you use that, you get a better idea not to just lock in your, your existing in, uh, uh, industry structure, but trying to, uh, to, uh, to help to develop it in a certain direction. And then you might not necessarily need vertical interventions to help exactly the solar panel plants, but you might even do with relatively horizontal interventions. And I mean, you can do so many things in terms of infrastructure, uh, in terms of education uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, institutions, um, in, um, yeah, in terms of letting experimentation, uh, allowing that. So I would think that this might be a very nice combination of, of targeting, but keeping it horizontal, that would allow you to, to target regions with a specific potential, with specific capabilities, uh, with specific, uh, specific horizontal policy tools. Thank you, Georg. And I think that's probably a, a, a great final word I think it's been uh, an excellent discussion, uh, certainly multidimensional uh, and different regions uh, within the EU, as, as you said, uh, you know, kind of looking, looking ahead while trying to, uh, you know, strategize for uh, sort of the, the low carbon industry of the future. So it's a, it's a massive challenge. Um, it goes beyond competition, of course, to, uh, social, economic policy, uh, the international implications. So it's, um, 
certainly something that uh, I think we'll have further discussions on. I would also recommend the, uh, the, the Bruegel piece on uh, carbon contracts for difference. I think that's a really uh, neat kind of uh, market-based solution uh, for industrial decarbonization. So with that, I would just, uh, again, thank our wonderful speakers here, uh, Georg, uh, Julia, Philip. Thank you so much uh, for providing the insights. And I will turn it over to the organizers for the next session. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Nolan. Thank you, Mike.